Okay. Okay. Hello, hello. Take a moment here to set up my technology center. <laughs> How is everyone? First week still treating you well? No. <laughs> no, already. <all right. laughs> because there's this one professor that assigned us. Viewing assignment and quiz, right? I got to email you at 1 o'clock. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> so I did not publish this. We're all getting used to new semester and new things going on. Uh, so I did not correctly publish the quiz last night. So quiz is now published. So how many of you completed the quiz online? How many of you did not? So you still have to just go and complete it sometime this afternoon. It's like short four questions and vectors on whatever you view on the video. Yeah. So sorry about the hiccup. Well, technology and I will get used to each other as the semester progresses. Um, so, and I have to, speaking of this technology, I have to be careful not to let this sleep because then I have to log into the wireless connection uh, again. The reason why I have actually set up there is that if I want to write, uh, I need a tablet. Or rather, I don't want to use the board because then I cannot record it. Okay. So I have to have extra technology piece there to write on a tablet so it's projected both on the screen and on my screen, and then it's captured by the video that I'm recording. So that's what's involved here, and that's why I was busy uh, just a moment ago. But before we get to that part, uh, let's actually finish up our introduction. Uh, we did, didn't have many slides left from the last Friday, and then I'm going to switch to the vectors that you actually introduced them uh, yourself to in the video. Now, the some of the technical parts, notwithstanding, where I start writing behind the <laughs> little uh, little video. How did you like the video? Did that work for you? Or there is actually a face. It's much easier to follow when there is a face. That's just the human factor. Okay? So the, that's why the videos that I record from class are not superb. They're just they, they're meant as a review of you being in class, so you have some memory of being in a class already, and then they're useful that way. Otherwise, they're hard to follow because there's no face. Okay? But I can't be both behind the computer and talking to all of you here, so I'm not doing that in the classroom. That's why, again, the recordings that are of the class are not professional, and they're not meant to be. They're just there to help you review later. So without further ado, let's just see where we left off last time. So we went through the syllabus. And basically, this is approximately where we uh, stop. So basically, in order to build any knowledge, this is not engineering, this is science and engineering in any really branch, we typically go to three things, theory, experiments, and computation, and computation being the most recent tool. So this class is actually about introducing you to the computation, or also known as numerical methods, as a tool to build knowledge. And I have these three kind of images that visualize that. So whenever we think of Einstein, we think of theory, theory of relativity to be precise. This is an example set up from the lab that is measure, measuring something, some sort of pressure, uh, or an ac acoustic wave propagation through the vac uh, rock sample. And this is a discretization of a reservoir with all of the wells in there. And there's some indication of geology in here that one can use for simulation through that reservoir, and that is quite prevalent in petroleum engineering. So we are not going to get to reservoir simulation in this course. There's a separate course that does that <laughs> in your later years, but this course is meant to introduce you and prepare you for it because you've got to build to it. Okay. Now, just to elaborate a little more, today, we are so used to technology. Beware our computers. Okay? And some of you have them on your watch as well. Okay? These are the type of computers that are way beyond anything NASA used in the 1960s. It's what you have in your pocket. Now, what do you use it for? You probably argue with people about 
something or the other on Facebook or like pictures of cast up there. Okay? So what you use it for is questionable, <laughs> but you could use it to send something to the moon, in theory, right? So back in the day, 1940s is when it started, early computers literally filled an entire room. There's more images on this link if you're interested to see. But this is an early computer, way less than any phone that you have right now in terms of the power, computational power. And these are the people standing just sort of for themselves. So there was recent movies. How many of you have watched Hidden Figures? Okay. What did you like about that movie? It was a layered movie. There was a lot of topics in there. But one of them was basically start of computation. So that took, whatever, three months or so to install the first computer in NASA. Three months to install. They had to change the doors to actually be able to get the thing into the room. Now, this movie back then, so NASA had a computer, right? <laughs> Not everybody had a computer. And even later, 1963, I found information online that there were about 15 computers total in the state of California. Should we count how many computers we have in the room right now? Okay. This is just for a comparison. And in 1973, there was one computer at the entire UT campus. So that's uh, quite something when you think about it. Now this movie, actually, I highly suggest viewing it on so many levels. It's a layered movie, movie about a lot of topics. Uh, but specifically, it actually focuses on uh, computation and the fact that once upon a time, there was a position called human computer. When there were no computers, they actually used mathematicians, typically, who <laughs> were training to compute. So scientists and engineers, everybody would come up with problems, but then some people simply had to sit down and compute pretty much with the help of a basic calculator. Okay. And the movie actually, it's a layered movie because also follows a group of black female human computers. Okay. And even today, in this world, there's not enough, neither people of color nor ladies in the world of computation or engineering for that matter. So now imagine 40 to 60 and so many years back, it was really uh, having that vocation was against all odds. So it's following them. But on a lot of, and actually Katherine Johnson, she had a birthday last week. She's 100. Okay. <laughs> so she's still there, and now there are buildings named after her. But basically, there's, it's, it's a great movie on a lot of them, but there's a lot of there actually just about power of perseverance and power of vision. So let me give you one example where the character, Dorothy Vaughan, uh, I think this is Olivia Spencer, is playing that cat character. So she realizes they're installing this computer. Okay? She is the boss of a group of 20 or so human computers. I'm still chuckling at that term. It's some useful <laughs> computer. But anyway, so she's a boss of a group of 20 of them. She's realizing, oh my, this thing is going to put you instead of us. Therefore, 20 people do not have a job. Okay? And she's like, oh, but it takes programming. And she actually goes and teaches herself Fortran. Okay? Fortran is, to this day, computing language, language and science. She finds a textbook, teaches herself, and while they were installing that Fortran and busy installing it, nobody thought, like, who is going to now talk to this computer? And by the time they installed it, she's like, I know how. Okay? And here's 20 people. She taught her group to program as well. And here's 20 people that know how to. So that's called vision. And you need that in any time, any period of time. Technology is always fast changing. 10 years from now, we have no idea what the technology will be. But it is your job to actually keep an eye and keep learning. So things will be changing. Learning that you do right here is just a start. Something will change on you, and you'll have to pivot okay, and change with that technology. So it's actually, again, movie is amazing uh, on a lot of 
of levels, and I can talk about it all day long. Okay. So, but what's also in interesting to see how computing looked like back then versus how it looks like now, and how it easy, it actually easy it is for us to access technology. So I'm going to see whether this works properly. When did they stop teaching Fortran here? Uh, Fortran, I believe, about 15 years ago. So there was a class. It was either Fortran, sometimes Fortran, sometimes C++. Or learning it instead of uh, Python. Yeah. I mean. yeah. So then we, in about 2006 or so, we consistently switched to MATLAB. And it was MATLAB until last night. And now it's Python. Well, it took Fortran. I think I was in 2012. Yeah. Oh, 2012? He took Fortran on undergraduate level. It's at C++, yeah, for architectural engineering. Architectural engineering, maybe. I'm talking about this department. So, different departments around this university, they take different courses. Okay? So, every a lot of undergraduate engineering introduction will be MATLAB or Python or something like that, but there are departments that actually go to C++ and C. So. And you as I learned, what was it, Pascal. Nobody knows what that language is anymore. It doesn't matter. The syntax, these if loops, for loops, and stuff that we're going to learn kind of remain very similar. And then it was basic, and then it was C for me. And I did learn some Fortran, just like over here it is. And to this day, I can find my way through Fortran by cut, copy, paste, and change. Okay, you <laughs> learn how to function <laughs> that way. Because again, a certain logic is similar in all languages. Okay? But then there are details, and the devil is always in the details that take you time, uh, take time to actually uh, get used to. And you will see that as we actually start. I have my muscle memory is in different languages. So I will be converting myself to Python. I started this summer, okay? So I started learning. And basically, I will be uh, practicing here in front of you <laughs> and with you. Again, there's a lot of it that I know, but there's a lot of the very fast thing, what it is that you type in correctly immediately uh, that gives you the speed. So you're here for lifelong learning. And whatever it is, 20 years from, from now, you're going to have to learn that. Okay? That's just how things. Uh, sometimes you cannot necessarily improve language, you just have to start over, so to speak, to actually address a challenge or two. So, many mathematical problems cannot be solved analytically. I'm going to give you one example today. And numerical methods are basically approximate way, approximate techniques to find that solution. They typically iterate. I take a guess, I improve it. I take it, I improve it again, and I go through the loop a thousand times. That's where computers are useful. Okay? A human cannot necessarily do that. Okay? And real world problems can take actually hours, even days to solve, even with the infinite computational power that we have today. Okay? So let's actually do one example activity. And we're going to implement an algorithm in class. So algorithm is simply a set of rules. Okay. that you come up with to solve your problem. You have to prove that that set of rules works. Okay. So we're going to do this. We're going to sum up a table of numbers. Okay. And we're going to pretend that that table of numbers is right here, this class. Okay. You, each of you, is a number. So everybody, think of a number between 0 and 5. Let's keep it, keep it simple. 0 and 5, think of it. Remember it. Okay. So now I want to find a fast way to sum it all up in this row. Okay. I'm going to come up with the following algorithm. I don't, say, I don't claim that it's the fastest. I'm going to say the person that is close to this edge of class in each row, you're going to tell your number to your neighbor. You're going to compute and sum the two and report the sum to your neighbor. And then repeat that. So everybody will hear, you will not hear any number, you just start with a number, right? So that's called initialization, by the way. And then you just tell the number, you sum up, tell that number, sum up, and keep going, okay? And the person at the end, that's gonna be a larger number by the time we get to the end, will hold on to the number. So let's do that first, okay? So everybody thought of a number? Start. Two. Two. So, hold on, 
everyday computers these days we have these days we have parallel computers now I am really going behind the time well, I'm gonna actually show you another interesting video after I finish this lecture because I think I have to go did you find it no oh well we'll just work with that uh, so basically people can compute but there are always human errors the speaking of the movie hidden figures the whole thing is that the human actually outperformed the computer because there was a bug in the code. <laughs> so the, the, the computer didn't, so you gotta watch the movie, there's, there's a lot of points in there, there's a bug in the code, so um, there's a lady that won. All right, so there are various programming languages that I already mentioned, and program, programming language is basically how we communicate to the computer, do this, okay? Do the summation, sum two numbers. We have to figure out where those numbers are, we have to get them into the memory, and then add them correctly, and then possibly store them or, or uh, get it. So we've got to work with those numbers in the memory, and the set of instructions is basically done in a programming language. 
So typically we write a sequence of commands. There's a, a syntax of how we do it. There are very strict rules, and that's a source of uh, source of frustrations for <laughs> a lot of people writing code. If you break those rules, then it's not going to execute. But also, bigger problem is actually that the computer does precisely what you told it to do. So often it's actually a mistake of logic, your logic. Okay? <laughs> so often it's doing what you told it to do, it's just that it wasn't the right thing to do. So there are two issues that you have to get used to as you learn how to program. And all of the all of the most of the languages have very common programming structures. They're the same in all of them, it's just that the syntax, how do we write them down, are slightly different. Okay. Now Programming languages, as I said, will change over the course of your career, so you just have to learn and go with it. Here's one example of very need, a uh, very don't need a numerical method, and that is a root of equation. So if I have a quadratic equation, most of you have learned in high school how to solve a quadratic equation. I have a formula, right? So I just fire up that formula, and boom, I have two solutions. Hi. Boom, and off goes my connection. So this thing is really finicky as far as connection goes. Uh, so reconnect. One oh, one five seven. 1017 There are sleep settings on this I have to work with. So if it were a quadratic equation, you know the formula. You don't necessarily, you can do it with a calculator maybe, but you can also do that calculation by case. Now, in case there are equations that don't have clear solutions and we don't have formula for, and one of them here, I actually do, there's ideal gas law. Everybody has heard of ideal gas law? So it's a simple law that relates my pressure, volume per mole, and there's R is a constant and temperature. So those are my state variables in thermodynamics, and I can figure out what the volume is of the gas given pressure and temperature, for instance, or the other way around. Okay? So whatever you give me here, if you give me two, I can compute the third. Okay? Now, if this, this is called equation of state, petroleum engineering fluids are not ideal gases, and specifically if you throw them three kilometers down, at that pressure and temperature, they're not ideal anymore, even if they were at the regular. So what we actually use most of the time is Peg Robinson equation that relates my temperature, volume, and pressure in this way. Okay? So it's highly nonlinear. I don't know how to solve this by hand. Okay? Would take a moment. And this, there's A and B in here that I actually compute for each gas from the tabulated version, uh, tabulated critical pressures and temperatures. So I know A and B. I still, if, I, if you give me P, T, or V, finding, for instance, volume at given pressure and temperature is a problem to do by hand. So we have to come up with a numerical method. Okay? So how do I actually do that? What we do is like we place this problem and we formulate it. We find a function of volume that for given pressure and temperature, 50 bar, and temperature of whatever it is that I wanted to do, 473, 473K, 
I plug it in here, and I find the function. So this is, I put 50 here and 473. And then I formulate it so that that function is equal to zero. And then I'm looking for the zero of this function. So what's the simplest thing I could do to actually find that zero? Take a range of V volumes, compute what that function is, and plot. And see whether I hit zero anywhere. Does that work? So that's called a graphical solution to this problem. Or I could do a guess and then iterate from there. Either way, what would be a good guess? If I had to guess, it's actually on the slide somewhere. Take the value for ideal gas. I know it's off, but it's closer than just guessing out of school, right? So that could be your first guess, and then see how well I did, and then try to move that around, okay? So that's my algorithm, okay? That's one way we're gonna do. So basically, I, would, I could take this as my first guess, and then I want to see how close I am, so I'm gonna actually simply compute f around these values, okay? So first one I'm gonna do f of 7, 8, 6, and I'm gonna get that it's 1.87. And I'm gonna get like somewhere close there to 750, and I'm gonna get that it's negative. Uh-huh. So I have a positive value, negative value. Zero is somewhere in between, okay? So I can start iterating here and take more guesses in between these two values until I get closer and closer and closer. So that's one way to do an algorithm. So then my next value could be 768, which is in between these two. I'm 0.75, okay. Now I can narrow it down. I'm somewhere between this and this, okay? 750 and 768, so I take a 759. Then I'm closer. And I can keep going until I'm happy. We're gonna define happy, okay? But that is essentially, and that's something that is easy to give the computer to do. You know, keep going. Just tell it the rules how to select the next iterate. Okay? I could have also just do a plot and see, zoom in here and see that the root is somewhere around 170, 755. Okay? So this is one way to construct algorithms and then employ computers to do the hard work. I'm not going to go into two other examples. We're going to get more examples as we move. I'm just going to do uh, Let's see if the sound will work. I'm going to try to play that movie just to show you how computing looked like at UT Austin back in the day. And my sound might not transfer, so I'm going to disconnect this and actually go here. So this is interview with Dr. Bomber. Does anybody know Dr. Bomber? No? So he's the professor. Here. Ah, mute. No, we don't hear the sound. Stop. Okay, I'm gonna stop this. Technology, darn with it, darn without it. There we go.
uh, punch cards and um, what was the, was it with industry, was it with like schooling and then what did you use them for? When I learned how to program at the University of Texas from about 1973 to 1979, punch cards were how you did it. Punch cards were the way you communicated your program to the computer. And they had some uh, typewriters, basically, and you would put your cards in, and they would be sucked into the typewriter. And then whatever line of code, one line only, one line of code you typed in, and then it would punch a hole at strategic places across the card. So if I had a program that was going to have 10 lines of code, I would have the first card would be, they called that the job card. That's how the computer knew, new job. Then after that came the cards that were line by line by line by line of the program. Then there would be an end card, and then if you had any data, that came next in the format that the program told the computer to expect the data. And then last but not least, as I recall, there was a green card that was the end, termination of the job. So everything between the start card, the job card, and the termination green card, that was your program and your input data. Wow. So if you weren't good at typing, this would take a long time. And so let's say I've got my little program checked, and I take it over to the computation center at the University of Texas, and they had some card readers. So they had big trays, and your, your program would go at the end of the tray, and they would take that one, put it in, read every card, put that deck back in the output, and then you would wait. So the computer now is thinking about getting to my program, and it finally spits out a hard copy. And it would show the listing of the program. It would show results, if it got to the results. If it thought there was a programming error, it would just put a code down at the bottom. You need to look at this line. There's something here I don't understand. So then you'd have to go figure out what was wrong, retype the card, resubmit the job, all of it. How long would it, if you just wanted to do one normal job, how long would you have to take in? Well, it depends on how many people are using the computer at that moment. Because in those days, the University of Texas had one central computer. Every place on campus fed their programs to that machine. To make a long story short, if your program was really a small program, well, you could probably get that back in an hour. But if it was a big one, mm -hmm. or if there were a lot of people using the machine, if you got two runs per day, you would probably do that. Oh. Do you ever miss punch cards? No. <laughs> do they fade out because of the computer and like the processing power of all that? No doubt. No doubt, processing power and the storage capacity of computers started getting to the point where I could take my program and I could sit here at my terminal and I could type in my program electronically and I could save it as an electronic file. And then whenever I was ready to submit it to the computer, I could. So as the data storage capabilities got better and better and Nobody really wanted to do punch cards. It was the only way you could get the program recognized by the computer. But in 1973, trust me, that was whiz bang stuff. <laughs> that was the cutting edge. That was the way everybody did it. There we go. All right. So I wanted to show you this movie. Whoops. I wanted to show you that as you start getting frustrated by writing programs, okay? It could be waivers. It could be actually typing things on a typewriter, taking it to that one computer at the University of Texas, competing for the time with everybody else and so forth, okay? So it is just the way things are sometimes. You will still, you will take time, but you will get good at it eventually. Now, before we actually get to programming, I have to get into...
this thing again. Um, we will actually briefly review linear algebra because linear algebra is the language of getting the data. And it's a formal language of getting the data into the computer and manipulating it. Okay? Which is why we are starting with the linear algebra uh, review. So I'm going to hopefully connect to this. Let's see. see. So I'm going to switch over to the vectors and actually so I'm actually gonna show you, I'm gonna answer so so did everybody get a chance to see the video? So we got everybody got introduced to vectors. Okay. So vectors are the way to talk about arrays, arrays of numbers. And I'm gonna quickly switch to just questions that I got online. This is what I see when you submit. Now this is a form that I've had over the years, so I gotta scroll down. So I got two questions, I believe. If I can get to them. One was the, so I see really a spreadsheet that is not behaving. Um, so I see a spreadsheet and all I see is a timestamp and um, the question or whatever you typed into the form. So what was relevant to these three are, I did not exactly understand the Euclidean norm and how to compute it and what it gives out. And also, uh, what is the P norm? And also the second question was, why are some norm uh, square roots and some absolute values? So let me get to Ningyu, I did find it. Sorry. Alright. So I'm getting to open. Open. Okay. So basically, if I had any vector, and this is doing it again. If I had any vector, okay. so if I had any vector, let's say that I have, okay. I turned off touch. No, it doesn't want to turn touch off. Hmm. Technology is on to me today. things off. Yeah. I'm going to write with my finger. Okay. I have you. Apologies, my finger is not as good. That is U1, U2, U3, okay? So my general P norm, okay, this is just a general way to define it, would be P is absolute value of U1 to the P plus absolute value of U2 to the P plus absolute value of u3 to the p to 1 over p. Okay. So if I substitute this p with 1, what do I get? Okay. 1 over p is 1. 
so that's not really a power of anything. And I have one here, one here, one here, so it's really sum of absolute values. If I substitute two, what do I get? So one over two, that's essentially, that power is square root. So square root of u1 square plus u2 square plus u3 square, whether I have absolute value or not in there, it doesn't matter because square, square of it takes. So I actually do always have absolute values in there. So there was a question whether you will always have absolute value. There's always an absolute value. It's just that if I have a square, whether I do u1 square or absolute value of u1 square, same thing. Okay? I could do 3. We rarely use that norm. I could do 4, 5. This is mathematicians for you. You could do anything. Okay? In reality, we use really three norms. One norm that is sum of all the absolute values. There are realistic situations where you have an uh, array where sum of all of the absolute values means something to you. Okay? And that is your norm. That is your measure of that vector. Okay? Square or Euclidean norm is the same as this 2 norm, or L2 norm, I'm going to refer to. That is the standard distance in our 3D world that we usually use. But it's air distance. Okay? So if I had to travel from here to that corner of the room up there, Air distance I can do by Euclidean or L2 norm, right? That doesn't tell me how much gas I need or whatever power, because in reality I don't fly. Okay? I gotta go this way, which is absolute value of U1 plus this way, which is absolute value of U2. So my actual distance is the sum of the y coordinate and x coordinate, or one coordinate. So that's my real distance in this world. So every time we are on a grid in a city, we actually have to, for proper distances, your Google Maps, if you will, you gotta use L1 norm. Not really, assuming you're snapped to a grid, okay? So not really the air distance between. So sometimes we need two norms, sometimes we need one norm. Okay? And sometimes, this is not mathematical abstraction, there's an entire mathematical theory behind this. When you let this P go to infinity, remember, remember taking limits in calculus class? Okay. So when you let that P go to infinity, you will actually arrive at the maximum of these values, which is our infinity. So mathematically, just finding the maximum of all of the absolute values is L infinity norm, and it's actually what happens when you take the limit when P goes to infinity. You're just going to trust me on that. So that is the mathematical result. And this also sometimes we're just looking for the worst case scenario, which is my maximum value in my array, and that's a norm of things as well. So in different situations, we're going to pick different norms that way. So essentially, that if I have u, let's say that I have u, that is 2, 1, and minus 7, okay? What is going to be my u infinity norm? Two. Maximum of absolute values. Seven. 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 So 7. So I do take absolute value. So norms are always positive. And then U1 norm is the sum of the absolute values. So it's 2 plus 1 plus 7 is 10. And then 2 norm, sorry for writing with my figure, but for some reason I cannot turn off reacting to my hand. And if I touch with the hand, it's going to do mess. Otherwise. So what is 2 norm? Square root of? 54. I'm not going to calculate that any further. Okay. So which one of these is useful happens to be decided by you, an engineer. Okay. So in different situations, different norms are useful. Okay. 
So here's one example where sum, U1 norm, is also useful. Uh, in Austin, we get a warning for irrigation or not to water our lawn, uh, things like those. When the level of sum of all of the levels of the adjacent lakes, like Lake Buchanan, Lake Travis, and so forth, that are actually supplying water to Austin, when that volume of water falls below a certain threshold, that's when we get those orange warnings, red warnings, and so forth about the watering. Okay? And you don't have probably watering laws duties in Austin, you know. Uh, but uh, some of us do, and then you have to turn off. Actually, I don't water my lawn at all. I just say water. So <laughs> I claim that I'm environmentally conscious. Actually just lazy. Uh, <laughs> and whatever plants I have could just survive me. Uh, <laughs> knock out pros, rosemary, and uh, one more I'm forgetting. So anyway, so basically that sum of the volume, Lake Buchanan plus Lake Travis plus whatever other lake, that is my sum of absolute values, right? And that is the norm I would program to have solve that engineering problem. In a different problem, you might use different norms, which is why I say that you as an engineer are in charge of deciding what works for you, so that's why we need a range of norms. Okay? All right. So that is it for today. If you haven't done the quiz, just go online and do it. Okay, by the end of the day. <laughs> Can I have one more, one more moment? I did not get any concerns about Thursday, 18th of October for a test, and Thursday, 15th of November. Is that still true? Should I send an email to collect that information? Because so far I have complaints about Wednesdays only. Thursday is good? Okay, so I'm going to send it to you. Because I actually deserve uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Thursday. So far, I didn't get a But to be continued. <laughs>